the next talk, uh, I think is very apropos. We are going to be diving into uh, analysis and how to be objective and be aware of biases. Um, Heather Honey is our next presenter. She is a private investigator who's worked internationally, been doing OSINT work for a very long time. Um, and I'm just gonna let her go ahead and get started. Thanks, John. I think that you just said that I'm old, but- No, I'll I did not. <laughs> I said you've been doing this for a long time, but that's all relative. I'm just talking about a few years, maybe. That's it, yeah, okay, well, thank you. Um, now, as you can probably see, I chose a very ridiculous title for this talk, um, but I'm doing that to address a really serious topic. Uh, hopefully I can do that in a lighthearted way. Um, at least that's my goal anyway. So Pinocchioitis, right? So that's a funny way of saying that you are saying or, or writing or tweeting things that are not true. Echo chamber osis should be self-explanatory. You know, surrounding yourself with only people who agree with you and insulating yourself from other ideas or other points of view. So who are the poor folks that suffer from these ailments, right? How do we know who has biases or who's been the victim of manipulation online or who has inadvertently consumed fake news? Well, let's check the diagnostic criteria. So, oops, too far. There we go. Um, according to the diagnostic criteria, that means everybody has it. You know, the human brain is really quite powerful, but it does have limitations. Cognitive biases are just the result of our brain trying to simplify or expedite certain processes. So you might not think that you have biases and that's okay because scientists have a name for that too. Uh, it is normal to be able to identify biases in others but not be able to recognize your own. Uh, and that's okay. Hopefully we can come up with a treatment plan for that today. All right, so why should you care about this? Obviously, as OSINT practitioners, we have to make a conscious effort to be objective. We all strive for excellence and integrity. These are just a few excerpts from the DNI's directive on analytic standards. Uh, I think it's really important to note the verbiage that they chose to use in here, and that is the need to employ techniques that reveal and mitigate bias. It doesn't come natural, right? We have to work at it. So you can easily swap out the word open source intelligence with researchers, investigations, journalism, those sorts of things, because these standards should apply to those fields as well, right? We wanna be objective and accurate in our work product, not distorting, not distorting our information by advocacy for a particular point of view. We have to make sure we have credible sources and clearly distinguish between information and assumptions. But whatever your work product is, if you are in the OSINT community, you and I'm assuming you all are because you're logged into this summit, but your work product should be aligned with these standards. While these things might seem like obvious standards, it is not easy to maintain these standards. Every person has cognitive biases, and that's why everybody needs to employ techniques to keep those biases from tainting your work product. Sorry about that, gone too far, there we go. Um, so, you know, the word bias tends to have a very bad reputation. And so I thought it would be a good idea to add some similar words, some softer synonyms. So if we think about our biases, at least some of our biases as preferences or predispositions, I think it makes it easier to acknowledge that we have them. Now for this talk today, I'm gonna kind of stay away from those hot button issues like racism and sexism. We're really not gonna address those um, no, we're not going to address them directly, but one of the things that you can start to do to improve your critical thinking skills is to be aware of your own biases. So if we start with the scientific fact that every human has biases, maybe we can shift the question from am I biased to a more productive question like what are my biases? All right, so I'm going to show you the next slide and I want you to think about your immediate response to what you see. Don't think too much about it, right? Just what is your gut reaction? 
All right, so if you are fundamentally opposed to Apple and you would never dream of using an iPhone, you, may have, you might have scoffed at that image. Um, and I guess one of the advantages of being virtual this year is that I won't ask you to raise your hand and say that your initial reaction was that, you know, gee, that apple water is probably delicious and high quality, right? So even if you wouldn't admit that out loud, maybe in your own private thoughts, you realize that your brain was predisposed to want that apple water. Or perhaps you had the opposite reaction. But the reason that you felt anything at all is that something happened in your brain almost like a quick automatic assessment. All right, so let's, super touchy. Sorry, folks, there we go. Um, we're just gonna take a quick look at a couple of really examples of common biases. So frequency bias, this is sometimes called the red car syndrome. Like you go car shopping, you see a really cool red Ford Escape, you buy it, you drive it off the lot. And for the next two years, everywhere you go, there are a lot of red Ford Escapes. Now, there aren't really more of them. It's just now you start to notice them. Your brain changed the filter. You might also be familiar with anchoring bias. And that is where the first information that we see, receive kind of acts as a uh, as an anchor and we put too much weight on that first piece of information. So that is why, for example, if you drive too fast if you come off of a highway onto a city street. It feels like you're going slow because the highway speed was your anchor. Now, those are just two examples of, there we go. Um, those are just two examples, but uh, scientists have identified 188 different cognitive biases and these biases enable and often drive online manipulation. Disinformation campaigns exploit cognitive bias. And our brains have limited resources. So in order to operate efficiently, they have to take these shortcuts. And we're living in a world of information overload. So the shortcuts are necessary. Now, if you focus on the uh, text to the right of this slide, it might appear that the image on the left is spinning. Now, even if you know that it's not spinning, your brain still perceives motion. Uh, if you want it to stop, you really need to narrow down on one small section of that image and focus in on it. And the same is true with bias. Knowledge of your bias alone does not produce a more accurate perception. We really need to, just as the DNI says, employ techniques that reveal and mitigate bias. We need to make a concerted effort to mitigate the impact. Okay, so let's take a look at this example. For those of you who are too young to recognize this, these are the stars of a 90s sitcom called Friends. This photo was taken about 30 years ago. These actors are now in their 50s. So if I ask you to tell me who you believe aged better, you may have seen them recently and maybe you already have an opinion about that. But what if you don't really know or you're not familiar with these folks? So to help you answer my question, I'm gonna show you these pictures. Now, I show you these, these current pictures. These are current pictures, and I ask you to tell me who aged better. So you can probably see that I'm trying to influence your answer. I am trying to manipulate you to answer in a certain way. These are both actual photos from approximately the same time, and the reason that I selected these specific photos was to manipulate you. But now, what if I didn't do this on purpose, right? Maybe I'm just a huge fan of Jennifer and I, I don't really like Courtney, or maybe I could be biased against Courtney Cox. And I didn't even realize that my choice of photos would impact your decision. I mean, this is a pretty blatant uh, example here, and I'm obviously trying to manipulate you or influence your opinion. But let's take a look at a real world example of just this kind of thing. So this is an actual screenshot from the Arizona Secretary of State's website that was taken on election day 2020. Now, how you react to these two photos is certainly related to your own preferences. Maybe the unflattering photo of President Trump doesn't bother you, but maybe it does. But what if Katie Hobbs had done this instead? Again, the way that you react to these two photos will depend on your own preferences. This is the Secretary of State's website used to provide information about candidates for political office. 
Now, I don't think that Katie Hobbs should try to influence my decision. So you might prefer one of these men over the other, but why don't we strive for impartial and unbiased? I think that should be our goal, right? We should try to recognize and reduce online manipulation. And we should give Courtney a chance. So why is this so difficult? Well, it's because bias permeates nearly all of our sources. Obviously, social media, news, search engines, pretty much all online content can be influenced by these cognitive biases. So if you inadvertently re reproduce uh, content that is manipulated, it could potentially impact your own credibility as an analyst or an investigator. So of course, we are inundated with disinformation and misinformation online. And Jane had a wonderful presentation this morning and shared some great strategies that they use uh, for investigating this. But look, there's universal agreement that disinformation is a serious threat. And uh, what we know is that our adversaries are sowing the seeds of discord and distrust, even on topics that they don't necessarily pick a side. Say so they look for wedge issues and exploit every opportunity. And sadly, we provide a ripe target. The thing is though, misinformation is often spread by unwitting social media users. It seems that Russia sort of sees US and, and other social media users, I don't mean specifically just the United States, but sees social media consumers as useful idiots. And many experts agree that the goal is not to promote one party or one issue over the other, the, but rather the goal is disgust. So here are a couple of examples of, um, of this is from the uh, Internet Research Agency indictment uh, that was a result of the Mueller investigation. And this is just show how, the, how our adversaries are exploiting bias and trying to inflame existing issues. Now, these are two ads that ran on Facebook the week before the 2016 presidential election. These are cheap ads for Black Matters and, and police randomly killing people with drones. Both of these ads were designed and paid for by Russia. And this was more than four years ago. This slide here is actually um, two professors, uh, Darren Linville and Patrick Warren from Clemson University are doing some amazing work in this space. Uh, and I highly recommend that you check them out if you can. Um, here is one Russian troll that they outed. And as you can see, this account had more than 20,000 followers. Maria Shriver, an NBC News journalist. I'm having some uh, technical, I, I can't really control the, the screen. I don't know, Sarah, if you can help me here, but it's not letting me, there we go. Is it possible that somebody else is, is also uh, on here? Heather, we can change slides for you if that's what you prefer. What, uh, I, I, I got it. It's just, it seems to be uh, changing without my, uh, without my consent. Okay, there we go. Hopefully, hopefully that's good. Yeah, so this, this particular Russian troll um, was outed by these professors from Clemson. And um, as you can see, there was a, an NBC journalist that retweeted it. The Chicago Tribune awarded this troll with uh, Tweet of the Week. And uh, again, the troll was simply hyping hate. Twitter, Twitter ultimately did suspend this account, um, but only after the team from Clemson called it out. So again, th these tactics evolve and they seem to be shifting away from sort of writing their own content in favor of sharing authentic content that supports their narrative. So this is a really interesting uh, thing. This was actually uh, part of a sealed indictment that is no longer sealed. But in July of 2017, the IRA spent $80 to promote a flash mob outside the White House. They got a pretty good turnout, but the crazy part is that this was a real organization. And the real organization that they partnered with had apparently no idea that Russia was promoting it. You know, useful idiots, that's how they see us. And these operatives have infiltrated authentic US activism and are driving uh, the wedge deeper and manipulating social media consumers. 
Um, I really like this quote from professors uh, Linville and Warren, and it basically says that, that effective disinformation is embedded in an account you agree with, not the ones you disagree with. And they, they don't push you away, they pull you in. And they do this by exploiting our biases. Um, they're trying to make us hate each other and they are really, really good at it. So here's your first prescription. Again, recognize and make a conscious effort to mitigate your own biases. So again, this is a treatment, not a cure. Um, they're never gonna get rid of bias, but it is, um, it's a good start. Okay, so you might not realize it, but you can also be manipulated by search engines. Dr. Robert Epstein's testimony at the Senate Judiciary Committee is really quite terrifying. Um, you know, he's done research into something that he has, that he calls search engine manipulation effect. And what he found is that search engines have the ability to manipulate the thoughts and behaviors of their users. And in the, you know, I mean, it could be up to 2.5 billion people. So I encourage everyone to read this full transcript, the testimony and the research behind it. But the basic idea that he's putting out there is that search engines can change what people think by manipulating search results. And the worst part about it is that users don't even seem to realize it. So if you go on to Google, and I know that's probably hard to see, but if you go on to Google and you try to figure out which computer to buy, you'll get a list of search results. And without thinking too much about it, the results that you see will influence your perception of which computer is best. Um, consider this, if you ask a friend, Mike, what the best computer is, you likely value his opinion. And you will think, you know, Mike says this one is the best. If you ask your friend John the same question, you might get a different answer. In your mind, you weigh those two opinions. We don't tend to look at search results like that. Most people look at search results as facts, but the results on DuckDuckGo are different because there is not one correct answer. It might help to reframe search results as opinions just in your mind and how you, how you conceive of them so that you're not putting too much weight on them. Um, the National Academy of Science actually published this search engine manipulation effect research. And it's really, really pretty compelling. So it's definitely worth your time to read it. And I'm gonna put these links and others in the hallway as well. Um, but Dr. Epstein actually continued that research leading up to the 2020 US election. And he says that he found evidence that Google was deliberately trying to change people's thinking up to the uh, US election. So if we think about that, you know, Google has absolutely dominates the global search engine market. You know, they have a lot of power. Sorry, they have a lot of power. And you can see by this, this, uh, this study that was done by an ad agency that shows that about 88% of all clicks are on the first page of your search results and almost 30% are on the actual, actually on the first result. So um, if search engines manipulate what's, what results appear on those, the first page in, in support of a particular cause or in support of a particular company, that impact could be huge. You know, the obvious prescription in this case is to be aware that your results could, that the results that you get on search engines could be influencing your thinking and then use multiple search engines to, um, to do your searching. All right, confirmation bias. This is a really significant issue in OSINT and this is the tendency to interpret information in a way that is consistent with your pre-existing beliefs. Um, and this is also what helps people create echo chambers on social media. You know, sometimes we don't want to hear opposing views. Um, and I can say that I am uh, in the camp of that. And at some times I absolutely cannot listen to Troy Aikman call an Eagles game. To me, it feels like Lex Luthor telling a Superman story, not good at all. But 100% of the time, I would love to listen to Merrill Reese because I know that he agrees with me about the Eagles. So I am seeking out my echo chamber in that situation. But if you are only hearing like voices on social media, then you are probably in an echo chamber. If you post a point of view and you only get likes or you only get positive comments or retweets, 
it is a pretty safe bet that you are in an echo chamber because in real life, people have different opinions. People have, you know, uh, have vastly different views of the world. So it, your social media feed should reflect that. So here is an example of how confirmation bias can impact an investigation. If you believe that what happened on January 6th was an insurrection, it will impact what you search for and how you find it. If you believe it was a protest, what you search for and what you find will likely be different. So more importantly, your pre-existing beliefs will impact your interpretation or analysis of that information unless, unless you take steps to mitigate your confirmation bias. And one of the most effective ways to do that is to consider the other side, consider opposing information. You'll be surprised how difficult it is to make yourself do that with integrity. It's difficult, but it is necessary to improve your critical thinking skills. Now, I've seen a lot of my friends in the OSINT community um, using their OSINT superpowers to identify people doing bad things on videos. Most recently using OSINT to identify people who were at the Capitol on January 6th. Um, but what's interesting though, if you look at the people who were doing that, and maybe you're one of them, you know, if the law enforcement agencies over the summer were asking for help to investigate, um, helping, asking for help online to identify some of the people who were associated with the looting and the riots over the summer. So if you identified five capital rioters, but you never tried to identify a looter, or if you were moved to spend your weekends this summer trying to identify looters stealing coach handbags, but you don't see anything wrong with the people breaking windows at the Capitol, think about why. Why is that? You're likely being influenced by your own biases. Stereotypes also impede critical thinking. It's hard to believe that this adorable creature um, could possibly harm anyone. But my koala stereotype was inaccurate. Some koalas attack, and this one caused this injury which required 12 stitches. So that's a funny example, but you have to kind of question your own belief system sometimes. So let's look at uh, heavy metal music fans, right? Now, perhaps you will make some assumptions about these guys based on the stereotypes that we have about people who listen to heavy metal. What you think and what you believe about them is largely dependent on whether you like heavy metal, right? Is that your in-group right there or is that your out-group? The problem for OSINT that though, is that if you let those stereotypes drive your research, you will find a lot of information that will reinforce those stereotypes, murder, Metallica, Slayer, congressional testimony. But unfortunately, you will likely not see information that disproves it. And this is true for journalists and investigators. Um, you only find what you're looking for. So if you, you know, happen to be a country music fan and you meet somebody new and discover that they're a heavy metal fan, you would hope that, you know, maybe you don't agree with their music, but it's not gonna make you hate that person just because they have a different musical preference, right? So those are the kinds of things that lead us to the issue of censorship, which should be a whole other um, OSINT topic, but I'm just gonna touch on it here, right? Because there's, there's a couple of different ways to approach the, the issue of censorship. Philosophically, right? Do we want all heavy metal fans to be ostracized? You know, I hope not. Do we wanna ban uh, heavy metal music? No, of course we don't. But on the, on the OSINT side, right? Just when we learn how to navigate parlor, for example, boom, it's gone. And now we have to try to find where these people have moved to, where, um, how, how to navigate the platforms that they're on. So there are definitely OSINT implications there. All right, let's talk about false information. Um, what happens if you read something that's not true and then you repeat it? Or what happens if you share something that's not true? Uh, the word Pinocchio-itis is actually from a Disney show in case anybody was wondering. Maybe some of you with kids have seen it, maybe not. But there are three good ways to treat Pinocchio-itis. And the first is source evaluation, right? Investigate the source of information, investigate the author. And you know, we really can't talk about sort of the, the sources things without mentioning the issue of fake news, which again was addressed earlier today. But um, I think it's important to know that if you, if, 
just because you see something on CNN or Fox News, it doesn't mean that it's news. There's a lot of opinion, a lot of bias going on in news today. Now, hopefully most people are not turning, tuning into Rachel Maddow or Sean, or Sean Hannity for news, but because these guys aren't journalists, right? They're commentators on opinion shows. But regardless of which side of the political spectrum you fall on, you do have to be able to recognize that journalism is not what it used to be. And uh, Jane mentioned earlier that, that journalists are often targeted for manipulation. And it's really often difficult to find an article that is absent of political bias. So there really is a need to return to impartial journalistic integrity. But in the meantime, just proceed with caution. One of the easiest things that you can do to keep bias out of your reports <clears throat> is to pay attention to qualifiers, right? Different qualifiers can turn a true statement into a false statement. So for example, all rectangles are squares is a false statement, but the statement some rectangles are squares is true. <laughs> Absolute qualifiers can turn truth into lies. So you definitely want to avoid these words. <clears throat> if I say every koala is timid or koalas never attack humans, those statements are not true. Therefore, by default, they are lies. <clears throat> Excuse me. Right. So if we, um, so in this case, absolute qualifiers are often indicators of blanket statements, right? All summer, there were stories about these pallets of bricks in big cities. People on social media and the news were using these broad blanket, state, uh, blanket statements about these bricks. And I saw several, several of these posts reviewed by fact checkers. But here's the thing. If you use a blanket statement, you make it false. The people that said all of the bricks or rocks were part of construction were wrong. It only takes one bag of rocks or one police report of a stash of bricks to make it false. But those people who said all of the bricks were staged by Antifa were also wrong. So if we eliminate blanket statements and just describe what we really have, uh, it makes all the difference and it makes it true. Another term is generalizing. I read a report not too long ago that said that the Gadsden flag is a symbol of hate, intolerance, and racism. Again, that's overly generalized. Hateful racists might be seen waving the flag, but that does not mean that your Aunt Judy in Tennessee with a license plate is a racist. These generalizations are so damaging. You know, it's kind of like seeing uh, uh, members of the Aryan Brotherhood, for example, wearing a pair of Levi's and you see two, three, five of them wearing Levi's. Does that mean that Levi's are a symbol of white supremacy? I mean, if you wear Levi's, does that mean that you support the Aryan Brotherhood? Of course not. So let's try to stay away from these broad generalizations. And of course, do not make assumptions, right? Um, you know, what happens if you assume that you have to be a member of the, the bald men's club to join this kind of webcast here? Um, well, you get the idea. So just do the work. Don't make these broad assumptions about things. Actually research and, and do the work, right? Because that is our work, to, to get in there and do the things that, that the general public doesn't necessarily do. And ultimately, education and awareness are the best remedies for bias and manipulation in any form, right? So do what you can to increase awareness, identify bias, and recognize the differences between opinion and fact. And I also believe that it's really important that we kindly and gently help each other and let somebody know if bias is creeping into their work product. So I hope that I've given you all something to think about. My time is just about up here. Um, I hope that this will help you improve your work product. And I also hope I haven't offended anybody. Uh, but one last thing, here is my shameless plug. Uh, SMART is a nonprofit organization dedicated to combating uh, social media manipulation. So if you want to get involved, reach out. Here's my contact information. I, I will post those things in the Slack uh, hallway, and I would love to hear from you, even if you don't agree with me. <laughs>